Let's come back to Hebrew meaning in Ephesians, the second chapter, and we'll now continue our study of the great letter which Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and also to us at the time. Read verse 4 again. The God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, and so on. The love of God is to be something we have to understand better and still better than we personally do. Let's uh, go into Matthew chapter 5 for a moment to read more about the fair and uh, the perfection which God calls for is a perfection of love, not just toward our friends but toward our enemies as well. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5 and we'll start around about uh, verse 43 and verse 48. Want to read those words, please? 14, 48, Matthew chapter 5. 43, 43, 48. Yes, please. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is Thank you very much. There are two kinds of love, obviously, referred to here. One is the love of the world which loves those who love them, and the other is the love of God which loves all men their friends or foes regardless. Now obviously of course this could be a works program. We could read these words and write, I'm required to love my enemies, it's going to be awfully hard I'll do it, do it even if it kills me. Let people talk about that. Right, that, that's a works program. The only way to love your enemy in fact is to have the love of God in you as a as the binding, guiding force, a principle that operates to naturally bring forth that spirit of we are to do by nature things that the law, not, not by force or by compulsion, not by not, not the sense of duty alone, but from a natural disposition. Now, God himself loves his enemies. I asked you the question, does God love his enemies? What would you say? Yes. I think that he loves Satan. Yes. yes. Sure does. Although, of course, he doesn't work together with him or fellowship with him at the same time his love is unchanged from the very beginning. Now, when we're told to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to do good to those who hate us, and pray to those who despite the use persecute us, in so do we become the sons of your Father in heaven. Now, why do you suppose Jesus called those who love their enemies sons of your Father in heaven? Right, because a son and a father share the same character or the same life. Just keep your place and we go across to John 8 verse 44 for a moment to know the contrast between these sons of God and the sons of Satan. John 8 verse 44. So I'd like to read it please. You are your father the devil. the other family, right? Oh, and who is the father of this family? Satan. Satan. And what kind of character do you find in these children? Satan. Satanic, or the murderers and the liars. Now, do you, can you associate merging and love together? Yeah. Impossible. Merging and hate, yes, but not murder and love. So, the strong point being made in these two different references is very simply this thing. <coughs> You love as God loves because you have the love of God in your heart, or you hate as Satan has because you have the spirit and this position of Satan in your heart instead. So no matter what is in will come out. So therefore, the better we understand the love of God and experience the love of God, the better we shall be able to naturally love our enemies and pray for those who despite the use of persecutors. Now, as Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 5, if you 
love those who love you, what you want of you, do not even thanks to make them do the same. Now, it's a rare thing to find a person in this world who is totally alone and and self uh, and self uh, satisfied totally. We all tend to seek companionship to our friends, to our um, fellow workers and whatnot. Even the worst criminals do that. And there's a certain love which binds them together in their common purpose and their common spirit. But that doesn't satisfy God and cannot satisfy him for another. We have to do something far better than that, which involves, of course, loving our enemies as well. Let's go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the second chapter again now, please. Ephesians 2 and uh, we're in verse, verse 4 still. Now, can we today understand the, the fullness of God's love? Not yet. In fact, it will take eternity for us to, to comprehend that. And even though God loved the fallen man with all his heart and all his being, he still required a struggle for him to let Christ go to save perishing mankind. In the early writings, he tried to tell us how three times Jesus went into God's presence and finally came out triumphant with the with the permission to come to the earth and die for perishing mankind. But the struggle to twice is for God to give up his son to die on Calvary's cross. Now, does this mean that God loved Christ more than man? Yeah, but after a struggle. That's what I'm making. And does that struggle mean that God loved Christ more than man? No, because it might not have entered into his mind to even let him go. That's true enough. God loves infinite in all directions. He loved his son infinitely. He loved mankind likewise. So there was a struggle of one love against the other, equal force and power. And God finally was able to let his son go to die for mankind as a demonstration of that love. Now, when God uh, did this, it was an expression of his character of love. He did it because he loved. As Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 4, that God is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, did all these wonderful things come thereafter. And what did he do? Verse 5, someone read for me, please. Ephesians 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And verse 6. He raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly in Christ Jesus. Right. <clears throat> now, when the man was dead in trespasses and sin, was it was an attractive prospect for the work of salvation? No. Not by any means. You know, I really admire the love of God as revealed in the angels because they minister unto us fallen beings. And we must, in their eyes, appear to be very degraded, very sinful, very unlovely. And yet they labor to elevate us to a position high and they themselves can occupy. <laughs> is that love? Yeah. That's a beautiful picture of the very love of God as revealed by the angels. And Jesus labors, or labored and still labors up in heaven too for that matter, to elevate us to a position equal to himself as joint heirs with him in the kingdom. Fellow kings, fellow rulers, fellow leaders throughout the entire universe. And this... Um, Willingness to lift a degraded, fallen, sunken human being to these heights and levels is certainly a manifestation of divine love at its best. So when Christ came to mankind, and God came to him, Jesus Christ, to man dead in trespasses and sins, he came upon a very unlovely, very uh, unattractive uh, subject for salvation. But Jesus saw not the subjects and of the prospects of the possibilities that were in that in that soul. I think that reminds me of the Zara of Ages um, where she talks about the days of conflict in Christ's life and shows how as Christ as a boy saw in his fellow human beings the possibilities that they might attain to. I'm so going to find this uh, here. Should be somewhere about page 86 or 87 or something else we can do. It's a very beautiful uh, 
revelation that early in life Jesus Christ is page 91 page 91 so I'm going to read the paragraph on that page and one paragraph on the page that goes to page 92 he taught all to look upon themselves as endowed with precious talents which if rightly employed would secure for them eternal riches he weeded all vanity from life and by his own example taught that every moment of time was fraught with eternal results, that it is to be cherished as a treasure and to be employed for holy purposes. He passed by no human being as worthless, but sought to apply the saving remedy to every soul. In whatever company he found himself, he presented a lesson that was appropriate to the time and the circumstances. He sought to inspire with hope the most rough and unpromising, setting before them the assurance that they might become blameless and harmless, attaining such a character as would make them manifest as the children of God. Often he met those who had drifted under Satan's control and who had no power to break from his snare. To such a one, discouraged, sick, tempted, and fallen, Jesus would speak the words of tenderest pity, words that were needed and could be understood. He met though he met <clears throat> he met he met who were fighting a hand to hand the word others on the previous page. Oh. oh others he met <laughs> who were fighting a hand to hand battle with the adversary of souls. These he encouraged to persevere, assuring them that they would win. For angels of God were on their side and would give them the victory. Those who he thus helped were convinced that here was one in whom they could trust with perfect confidence. He would not betray the secrets they poured into his sympathizing ear. Thank you very much. Come to the previous page, page 91, and uh, I, I appreciate this story says that uh, he, he saw this part of that the most rough and unpromising setting before them the assurance that they might become blameless and harmless and so on. So the most rough and unpromising were the subject of Jesus Christ's loving care even as a boy and a youth, which of course was a revelation of the presence of God's character in him. Now, if you go to the on the final paragraph of page 92, yet through childhood, youth and man, man of Christ walked the land. And it was there that the people together with him. Now, why did Christ walk alone upon this earth in view of the fact that he was so attractive a character, so beautiful a person, so loving and so healing and so saving? Why did he walk alone? No one really understood his mission. Right. Because he's a unique person. Now, it's a rare thing to find a person in the love of God presides in all the strength and power which is presided in Jesus Christ, but you might not find anyone more today in that category. So if you attain to the love of God in your heart and live as Christ lives as a youth and as a man later, what can you likewise expect? Same thing. Same thing to be one of a kind. Yeah. Another reason I think you walked alone, uh, when somebody has a character and a loveliness that's so far above yours, uh, at first that will attract a person. But then, unless they wanted to be like that themselves, unless they wanted the change, it would repel them because it would be a constant rebuke. Sure. So. Precisely. Precisely. Now, Christ was so unique, so different from all the rest, that he walked the land, but for the of course, there was this conflict between himself and the powers of darkness and the call for sacrifice that Kim mentioned a moment ago as well. Now, at the same time, we must uh, be impressed by the fact that Jesus Christ had this outreach for souls and this great burden for souls, and even as a young man and a boy. Now, if we likewise possess the love of God in our hearts, we still have a tremendous burden for souls, 
We find ourselves using every moment of time all our resources in reaching out to person mankind. And Sister Light talks about the fact that we see so little of this spirit in, in the believers of her time. I guess we don't see much of it in ourselves either, which is very sad to say the least. Now, how do we obtain the same love which Christ had? How, how do we appropriate or come into possession of the love of God? It was a gift, wasn't it? Turn to Acts the Apostles, page 551. And uh, it's plainly told there that it is, in fact, a gift. Page 551. One of the greatest. Uh, Paragraphs of two on the love of God, which you'll find anywhere in, in, the, in the scriptures. Right, uh, maybe we should come back to page 550 and uh, read, uh, well, I'll like the whole page, I think. Can okay, you command it? So it's a little book. I can. You got it? his brother has true love for God. The true Christian will not willingly permit the soul in peril and need to go unwarned, uncared for. He will not hold himself aloof from the erring, leaving them to plunge further into unhappiness and discouragement or to fall on Satan's battleground. Thank you. Yeah. Can you relate that a little bit to the chapter on true missionary work in uh, God's house? seems like there's an apparent contradiction there. She seems to be saying every person that you can see that needs the gospel, you're going to go out and share it with. But yet in true missionary work, you show how it's you know got to be the Holy Spirit telling you which person to speak to, when, and everything. Can you relate those two a little bit for us? <coughs> I think so. I'll try anyway. Concerns um, relates to the true step of the first message to these words in Acts the Apostles. Now, Jesus, we, we get the impression, as Kimber has pointed out, that these words direct us to go out and talk to God's every single person that we meet. But we don't find Christ doing that. We find that Jesus Christ that drew all men unto him and he spoke to those who were drawn by his matchless love. We shall find that if we have in our hearts the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, we too shall draw all men unto us, right? And you, you won't have to go out looking for souls. You'll find yourself so fully preoccupied with dealing with those who come to you that there's no time for anybody, anybody else anyway. Now, we should manifest the same tender compassion that Christ manifested. Um, Let's, 
let's just ask ourselves a question right now. Do you feel satisfied with your personal burden for souls? No. I don't even know what is the problem. Why, why don't we why don't we find ourselves burning with uh, concern for those perishing around the battles? Why don't we? We just don't have that love of God. It's really true. We love ourselves more. Yeah. Well, we pray, we consecrate ourselves every day, we study the word of God, we search the scriptures. What are we, what are we doing we shouldn't, that we should be doing? What are we not doing we should be doing? It's hard to eat from way over there. of his government in heaven and earth. And here's where I find right now the next sentence, which is very important, and I found that it, the, the only way I can get it is, if our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, if divine love is implanted in the, new, in the heart, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Hebrews 10, verse 16. And if the law is written in the heart, will it not shape the life? Sure. Okay. Obedience, the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. Thus the scripture says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. What I see the problem is that, is that that love has not been implanted in us. We have a kind of love, but not the depth of love which the Lord wants to implant in us. Well, we all admit that. We recognize our faith. Yes, and it, it is a kind of... Well, I know from my own experience that because of my own family background, it is difficult for me to reach my own family because of familiarity with them and their sins. You've, it, it's easy to grow tolerant of what is in their lives because you love them. But also I recognize, I've been recognizing, the burden has been laid upon me, that I am doing them the worst service I could ever do them by allowing them to continue. So I have asked the Lord to cleanse my lips from iniquity and to put his words into my mouth at the time they need to be spoken. The time is very important. Yes. Because um, the Spirit of God must prepare the soil before you can sow the seed of right. the soil. And therefore, the um, <clears throat> timing does become extremely important. Now, what we have to, to recognize though is this, that um, 
it's one thing to kind of a burden for souls, and something else to actually go to them. Now, the burden for souls should be a constant experience. Going to them, of course, should be a matter of the right point of time, should it not? Yes. So we all recognise this morning, I'm quite sure, we do some very, very severe self-examination today, that we do not have the burning love of God we feel we should have, the zeal for soul we, we, we ought to have at this present point of time. And the question is, what, what should we do that we're not presently doing in order to acquire that love? Certainly, certainly we have a measure of it because being born again automatically gives it to you. But uh, how to attain to the full strength of Christ is, is another question, isn't it? So what, what should we do yet that we have not yet been doing?
So heaven's measuring line is do you love as Christ loves and do you work as he worked? If you do, you're fit to be a worker in the eyes and sight of heaven. Now, um, take the first sentence and the next but one paragraph someone plays. You want the whole paragraph? No, just the first sentence. Let us not love in the word. We want to ask that. But in Supreme love for God. Supreme love for God, unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. Thank you. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. So this love that we need so desperately comes to us as a gift. We would be rich at the hand of grasp it. If it comes as a gift, then why is it so difficult to obtain? Why are we so slow to obtain to this gift? Let's, let's ask ourselves now, how do the gifts of God come to us? The gift of salvation, the gift of love, the gift of peace, the gift of power, the gift of uh, ability to do God's work and so on. How do, they, how do these gifts come to us? What, what's involved in their bestowment? Now the first step I do believe, and I'll take this quite step by step, is for us to realise our destitution in a given area. That's the first step. Okay? Realise our destitution, our great need of this thing being given to us. And that need will be realised as we, as we spend time in the state of the life of Christ and see our love operate in Him. And we compare the fruitfulness of His ministry with, with, with the barrenness of our own. When we find ourselves loving some people, not all others, with the same intensity, we then begin to realise how far we fall short of that divine gift. With that, that realisation, of course, come the next step, which is to reach out and ask for the endowment of the gift, right? To positively ask for it, to claim it, to possess it by faith, to go our way and we shall realise the gift when we need it most, in the terms of except, uh, um, I swear again, I saw a confession, but uh, the true science of prayer. Now, at the same time, we should become aware of what blocks the coming into us of the gift of God and the blessing of God because if we cherish sin you'd be absolutely certain that God will not give you his blessings in that situation sin must be gotten rid of must be soul cleansing before we can receive the blessing of God so then we need first of all a clear and in fact ever, ever clearer knowledge of our destitution of our great need we come within our state within so the promise of God and believe it by faith. We come and claim the promise, we receive the promise, we go away possessing the gift, and in time comes the realization. Now obviously, of course, the uh, the more we spend time every day receiving the life of God in our soul and our daily communion, the more we shall receive the love of God as well, because the life of God is in fact the love of God. Any, any thoughts you'd like to express on that point then? covered it fairly well. <coughs> okay, let's come back to our book then, page 551, Acts the Apostles. And um, <laughs> when I read the paragraph, let us not love in the word the apostle right, but in deed and in truth. That little paragraph, please. Let us not love in word the apostle writes, but in deed and in truth. The completeness of Christian character is a chain when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. It is the atmosphere of this love surrounding the soul of the believer that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. Thank you very much. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. So, the word constantly, of course, indicates something which is there all the time, not here and gone again, but they're, they're all the everlastingly there. And um, we shall have a complete Christian character when the impulse to bless and help others springs constantly from within. Next paragraph now, please. Supreme love for God. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power, the unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. We love him because he first loved us. 
In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, and ennobles the affections. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a, a refining influence on all around. Thank you. Now, the very best gift which heaven can bestow, of course, is supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. It comes as a gift. Now, this love is an impulse but divine principle, a permanent power, which cannot be originated in the unconsecrated heart. Now, let's, let's impress the point upon our minds, of course, that the more we receive of the life of God, which, of course, is the outpouring of the Spirit of God, the more we shall have of the actual love of God. Let's go to Pentecost for a moment to see how the coming of the Spirit then was a beautiful and powerful and comprehensive endowment of love upon the hearts of those way disciples. And this tells us, of course, that the latter end comes we'll find that the same thing will be true in our experience as well. Page 38, I do believe. What yes. book is that? What book? Acts the Apostles. <coughs> Page 38. <coughs> So I'll read the first paragraph of the page, please, the Spirit of Cain. The Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The Infinite One revealed Himself in power to His church. It was as if for ages this influence had been held in restraint, and now heaven rejoiced in being able to pour out upon the church the riches of the Spirit's grace. And under the influence of the Spirit, words of penitence and confession mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Words of thanksgiving and of prophecy were heard. All heaven bent low to behold and to adore the wisdom of matchless, incomprehensible love. Lost in wonder, the apostles exclaimed, Herein is love. They grasped the imparted gift. And what followed? The sword of the Spirit, newly edged with power and bathed in the lightnings of heaven, cut its way through unbelief thousands were converted in a day. Thank you. Now what an encouraging picture this is. Wonderful picture. Now first of all, all heaven bent low to behold and to adore the wisdom of massless, incomprehensible love. And lost in wonder, the apostle exclaimed, here in is love. Now let's put this all together, shall we? This was the outpouring of the Spirit of God. It was therefore the outpouring of the life of God. It was therefore the outpouring of the love of God. The Spirit of God, the life of God, and the love of God all are one and the same thing. Are they not? So therefore this tremendous outpouring of divine power in the Holy Spirit is the tremendous outpouring of love upon those waiting disciples. Now, through the effect of receiving that love, they grasped the imparted gift and what followed. The sword of the Spirit, newly edged with power, and bade the lightnings of heaven cut its way through unbelief, thousands were converted in a day. And we can look back, of course, with joy upon that wonderful scene of long ago, but with greater anticipation to join the coming scene, which will naturally be repeated in the very near future. And once again, in even greater power, the Spirit will be poured out, which will be the life of God being poured out, which will be the love of God being poured out. And what shall we do? We should exclaim, Herein is love. We should have grasped the part of this one shall follow. Thousands. Thousands of the converted day as the word of God cuts through unbelief and the darkness of, that, of, the, of, of this time. In the meantime, let's not wait, of course, for that to take place. Let's every day come before God and plead with Him that He would change us so we can receive a mighty outpouring of that spirit and that love at this present time right now. Now, we just drift along. Day after day, there's nothing about this. We shall, not, we shall not acquire this great gift that we work at it. If we really spend time in prayer, put away every distraction that would divert us from this, this objective, we shall certainly find our love increasing and our burden for soul becoming greater and still greater. Now, in Acts the Apostles, page 551, we find that this love has a very powerful effect upon the, uh, upon the person. In the heart, in by divine grace, the love is a ruling principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, and ennobles the affections. This love, cherished in the heart, sweetens the life and sheds a refined influence all around. So if you wish to have a modified character, govern the impulses, control the passions, and ennoble the affections, what do you absorb? 
uh, to achieve that, the love of God, right? And uh, the Christian does not uh, directly aim to achieve those objectives, <coughs> rather he produces produces a cause, which is the love of, love of God in the heart, and then these objectives naturally follow on. And someone read, please, the next paragraph from John Stewart, to lead the believers to understand their exalted truth. Page 